Okay, so let's let the waiting room in and then um, we can get started. You got the recording, Mike? I just started recording. Perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to session two. Hope we have some more people in the waiting room. Wait just a little bit. There's some more people popping in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to session two of our Spring 2024 Teaching Effectiveness Institute titled Grading for Equity. What is it and why does it matter? We had a wonderful discussion with Dr. Shantha Smith of the Crescendo Education Group earlier this morning, and we are going to be building upon that with some amazing members of our CIDL team. And My name is Dr. Yvonne Johnson, and I will be the moderator for the event representing the CIDL team. I'm excited to have those of you on who were participating earlier today, and welcome to those of you who joined us for the second session. We are excited to have such an important conversation about grading for equity, which aligns with our NIU mission and goals. and supports and connects with our inclusive and equitable learning and teaching and um, community goals. Thank you all for joining us and for sharing your insights in this group today. The two presenters that we will have leading this session are Dr. Lindsay Vrehan. She is from the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and Dr. Vreeland is an inclusive teaching coordinator at CIDL, our Center for Teaching and Learning, where she helps educators create inclusive environments for their students. Lindsay is a first generation graduate with a, doc a college graduate with a doctorate in English literature and a graduate certificate in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Before joining the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning team, she was a coordinator for the NIU Writers Workshop. Lindsay has taught composition, literature, and gender and sexuality studies courses for the college level for over a decade. Her co-presenter is Dr. Lynn Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen is an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. She provides professional development for faculty, staff, and graduate assistants on strategies promoting equitable teaching practices for traditional and digital learning environments. Although new to the professional development field, Lynn is an award-winning educator with over a decade of teaching experience in higher education. Lynn earned her PhD in chemistry at Duquesne University and her Master of Science from the University of Oklahoma. Lynn is a community leader and the recipient of the 2023 Dr. Richard A. Flarney Engagement Award. Now I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Wynn and she will go ahead with the presentation. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for um, the introduction and welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Santa Smith's presentation earlier. Um, Dr. Santa Smith's presentation highlighted the three pillars for equitable grading or grading for equity, um, accurate, 
bias resistant and motivational. But um, here you see I have in the title grading for accuracy, equity, and excellence. So what I've been doing before I learn about the book or anything about um, grading for equity, I've been challenging uh, myself as well as my colleagues to use the word excellent every time you think of the term equity, because I want everybody to consider um, being equity minded doesn't mean you have to compromise on quality. Instead, um, it challenged us to strive for excellence in every aspect of our work, um, whether we work in education, government, private or public sector, I find it's true that equity come with excellence. So in this second part of the workshop, uh, Lindsay and I will be discussing with a uh, focus on the four topics that you see here, attendance, participation, behavior and effort. I, I have been teaching chemistry for more than a decade, both here at NIU uh, as well as at, at the institution and both at the undergraduate as well as graduate level. And my class size vary from six to 200 students. Um, I have interact with almost a thousand students every academic year since I get to NIU in 2016, because I'm responsible for teaching the Gateway General Chemistry course, um, also a general education um, course. So from my interaction with students, I have learned a lot, and I will share some of the lessons that I learned with you today. I have heard many um, challenges, struggle, as well as triumph story from our students over the years, and and um, our students are diverse. They face different challenges. They do not all come with the same social capital or and, and they have different opportunity for development. Um, and that because of the result of diverse recruitment would be commendable. However, our graduation rate is still at about 45 to 46%. And this rate even lower for black students um, at 30% compared to white student as about 60%. So I hope that the thought provoking idea share today will spark a transformation um, in our grading practices and ultimately benefiting the growth and success of our student. Um, next slide, please. So um, attendance, uh, should we grade attendance or not? Um, what assumption do you make when students don't show up? And what is the reality? How can you find out? Will you ever find out? What might be some obstacle that students are facing? So in this, um, the picture in this college depict things that my students have told me about um, over the years, such a medical emergency, death of a loved one, um, birth of a loved one, court order, unexpected change in work schedule, issue with law enforcement, breakup, divorce, and mental health um, problems. And in the past, I usually require proof um, for these events, and most of them provided. Um, I require proof, not just for attendance, sometimes for extension. Um, the, the discussion that's come up in, in the earlier breakout session um, about extension, who do we give extension to and who we do not and how can we be fair? Um, so, uh, so this story, I, I over the year, um, I decided to stop requiring my students to provide evidence of their unfortunate life events, um, especially when I cannot do anything to help them. Um, I felt like the least I could do is to be understanding and supportive. I had a student who told me her brother was in prison. He had a chai, and the mother of the chai, her, her nephew, just died. Um, so now she's the primary caregiver of, of a toddler, and she was only 18 and a freshman at NIU. And she apologized for being behind in attending class and completing classwork. So I offer her extension and put her in touch with the family coordinator at the NIU Child Development and Family Center where my children go. 
Um, I also once had a student who was a veteran and a primary caregiver of his father who suddenly unexpectedly diagnosed with brain cancer. So he was a talented and responsible student, but he was hesitant to ask for help. I reached out and assured him that I would dare to help all students succeed. And I offered him extension and told him I would do the same thing to anyone in similar circumstances. So these story as example of students with different racial and social backgrounds, they face different challenges. But when I try to make my class policy and practice it equitable, everybody um, beneficial from it. So um, how should we address the equity issues such as these? Why not penalizing students because we assume they are just lazy or unmotivated? Um, if you do want to great attendance, I suggest that uh, perhaps you should consider these questions. Um, sorry, my light in the office just went off. Energy saving, gotta love it. Um, so uh, what do you want your the attendant grade to represent? Do you want attendant grade to represent student acquisition of the learning objective or do they represent student compliance? Uh, and then what are the most important thing you want um, the attendant grade to accomplish for you as an instructor? Does the attendant grade inform your instructional decision or do they inform your feelings? So I recall I feel great when I put in all the time and effort to prepare an outstanding interactive lecture and there was uh, the, the room were full. They were an audience to my super preparedness and knowledge. But then when I were prepared and then there not a lot of students show up, I felt terrible. So um, so think about these things when you do decide that uh, you want to grade attendance or perhaps you decided that you're not gonna grade attendance. And uh, what are the most important things you want your attendance grade to accomplish for your student? Do you want the attendant grade to incentivize learning or do you want the attendant grade to incentivize compliance? So during the global pandemic, the way we teach and learn had changed and being a working mom of two real young children, uh, this new situation inspired me to take some drastic measure. It's not perfect and um, I was still working on it, but I decided to create um, I, I decided to use my online asynchronous course on Blackboard and use it for my online for my in-person classes. So um, I after the when we get back to work after the pandemic for my online student, I provided them the option to attend my in-person class. And for my in-person student, I provided them the option to join my class virtually or frankly, not attending class at all. And they can still successfully achieve the learning objective, the course outcome and pass the class. So I designed a course to be online asynchronous, um, which enabled a student to, um, to complete the course even if they couldn't attend class. And when only a small group of students attended lecture, um, the lecture hall that designed for 200 students, Fairday 143, if you know where it is, um, when only a small group of students show up, I felt terrible, but I have to learn, I have to train myself to let go of my ego and remind myself that I create this environment. I intentionally provide multiple options and, and flexibility to accommodate all students and, and how they, they learn. So, um, we, we will talk about some of the questions, but I have one more slide to present and then we're gonna move on into the first breakout session. So um, next slide, please. Uh, the next thing I want to discuss is participation. So how do you, we equitably assess student participation? Um, should we grade or not grade participation? And how do we equitably grade participation? Once again, same question, what assumption do we make when students don't raise their hand or don't participate? And what is the reality? Can we find out? Uh, what might be some obstacle that students facing that we are not aware of? So as an undergraduate student, um, 
I am a first generation immigrant. I immigrate to the US when I was 21 and I could not speak English. I, I, I didn't know English. Um, so, but then I know I want to learn. So I attended community college and I took a bunch of math and science courses because I know the universal language of numbers and the chemical simple are the same in Vietnam and in the US. So um, I know the, the content knowledge. I did, didn't know the English. So I almost always knew the answer to my professor question if it's like a math question or a chemistry equation question. But I never raised my hand it's not because I were afraid of being wrong, but I were afraid of my English. I were afraid of not being able to pronounce or uh, enunciate the word correctly. Um, one time in front of a group of outstanding A student and administrator, I pronounced the word sheet as in a sheet of paper, but I used a short E instead. So I'm not going to say it out loud, but try to pronounce the word sheet of paper, but with the short E and then you see. So I make a terrible mistake. And I know that because the room just looks stunned. Everybody look at me awkwardly. And then a few snickers, um, people trying to hold the laughter in. They were really polite, but I knew I make a mistake and I was very embarrassed and I never want to experience that again. So I, I don't raise my hand. I don't participate verbally. Um, and over the year, I work really hard to improve my pronunciation and I can pronounce a short E and a long E. It took um, a very skillful ESL teacher who told me that every time I attempt to pronounce the long E, make sure I smile. So now I smile every time I say a sheet of paper. <laughs> so despite struggling with English, I were uh, a straight A student. However, there were classes where I were made to feel stupid because of my lack of verbal participation. So if you must grade participation because you teach a seminar course or a discussion based course, um, where, where participation is a necessity, I, um, I, I hope you consider this question. Um, like, can she? these questions before you uh, develop grading rubric for your class participation. Do you develop norms or guidelines for your class participation? And better yet, do you work with your student to develop these norms? Um, when the student go generate guidelines or norm with you, they take part in establishing the type of participation they wish to see in the classroom. Plus it'd be easier for you to reinforce the norms and remind students that they co-create this and they agree to these um, policy. Depending on what your courses are, um, you might want to consider different norm. For example, if you are teaching a discussion-based social justice education course, you might want to consider challenge some of the common guidelines for discussion because many of the established guidelines reinforce the unequal power dynamic in higher education and in our society. The second question I want you to consider is, um, do you construct equitable way to call on your student to participate? Is it essential to manage who is speaking, when, and who is taking turn in your classroom, right? We don't want a few loudest voice or the most confident voices to continue to choose when they speak and inadvertently silent the more quiet voices. At the same time, we need to be mindful and not silent the ones who are engaged and passionate about the topics. So what do you consider when you're constructing practical and equitable ways to call on students? Do you call cold calls? Do you allow wait time? Do you allow right time um, after you ask a question? Do you integrate think pair share opportunity during a class session to cultivate classroom equity in multiple ways? And the last question I want you to consider is, do you have strategy to nurture voices that challenge the dominant narrative? Do you pay attention to who voices are we hearing and who voices we aren't hearing? 
And if there are voices that we haven't heard from or perspective that we haven't heard from, do you prioritize making more time to allow space for those voices and those perspective? Um, now, if you answered yes to all those questions, then yes, let's talk about how we can equitably grade student participation um, by developing strategy for effective communication, uh, strategy for providing timely feedback that promote growth. And um, the last thing is strategy for developing grading rubric, rubric for student participation that, um, that are equitable. And we would love for you to share some of your uh, practices, um, policy during the upcoming breakout session. And um, if you answered no to any of the three questions that I asked here, develop norm, construct equ equitable ways or nurture voices that challenge the dominant narrative, then perhaps um, slow down and rethink our grading practices regarding participation and refer back to these questions that I asked in the first slide. What do you want participation grade to represent? What do you want participation grade to accomplish for you and for your student? Um, so next, next slide, please. So now we're gonna get ready to uh, follow the link to the Padlet for, for the breakout session one. So on the Padlet, or I saw that might have put the link in the chat. You're gonna see a few prompts and feel free to pick one or many of these. But in your group, I, I want you guys to reintroduce to each other because I think most likely you're gonna have some new member in your group. And then you can talk about, take the next, um, maybe you should cut it to 13 minutes and we're running short on time now. So take the next 13 minutes to discuss the prom in the Padlet. Uh, you can participate by talking, by writing, typing, but please have at least one member of your group add some notes um, to the Padlet board. And then we're gonna reconnect here and share after 13 minutes. All right, I'm gonna start the breakout rooms. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Sorry for interrupting. I uh, just wanted to let you know that the breakout rooms will be closing and we will see you back in the main session shortly. So finish up your thoughts. Thank you.
Is everyone back? Hi, welcome back, everyone. I see. So I think we have time for perhaps two people to share what you discuss in your breakout groups. You can um, raise your hand. Let's see. Okay, so I, I'm gonna um switch to the Padlet for just a minute. If anybody here raise hand, um, Lindsay or Yvonne, can you please uh, let me know? So um, we have some really nice notes um in the participation. Um, so I'm gonna read one. We find benefit from required participation for certain classes like labs, discussion courses. We also prefer flexibility for lecture classes to accommodate student lives. Um, some of us use attendance for a small percentage of the grade. It works for building good attendance habit and signal the teacher to check in on the student. So um, I'm gonna pass the Mike, back to Lindsay so that she can lead her to the next um, two topic. And then at the end, during the reflection and closing thought, we can, if we have time, we can go over some of the thought and idea that was shared in the breakout session. Lindsay, it's all yours. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I have two more topics that um, we're gonna cover. Uh, thinking about grading and thinking about specifically grading um, more personally and within the classroom, what do those behaviors look like? So first, I want to talk about uh, specifically behavior in class management. Um, are we creating and encouraging cooperation and community with our class policies and grades that we do for behavior? Ideally, we should be encouraging community and building relationships where students are feeling comfortable, where we're feeling comfortable in order to uh, discuss materials and ask questions and get to the bottom of, um, of what we're looking at. Um, are we creating policies to prevent undesired behavior and to punish it rather than address it or create space for understanding? Um, a lot of times we create these policies because we're thinking, well, I don't want somebody talking over me. I'm in control of this classroom. And it's really about our egos rather than about like what makes sense for the classroom and giving people the opportunity to, to chime in if you're giving information that's confusing or um, this idea that we can't manage a classroom without raising our hands or without behaving a specific way. Um, so when we are actually assigning grades to behavior, student behavior is then interpreted and categorized in order to specifically be punished, right? Um, it's this idea of like we're working from an A um, from complete total points and uh, little things that you're doing that are disrupting that, we're gonna take off points for that. Um, so this is how we interpret behavior and we label it disruptive, unprepared. Um, and these grades focus on punishing outliers instead of bringing them in and creating understanding, why does a student come in and seem to be quote unquote unprepared? Why is their behavior considered to be disruptive? Uh, is it actually disruptive or, again, is it just hurting our egos or um, is it something that we were corrected for doing earlier um, in our uh, days as learners? Um, labeling differences doesn't build trust or community. So uh, labeling a behavior as, as specifically being disruptive 
uh, doesn't create an environment where people are going to be um, as as willing to come in and have those conversations and to be authentic. Um, and when we're asking students to conform to standards, they might be forced to mask aspects of their identity. So when we have students that are neurodivergent, when they're disabled, uh, queer students, students of color, sometimes their behavior, their language, their reactions, and their tone of voice is interpreted as being disruptive, disrespectful, inappropriate. And so that's something that we have to check then too. Are we coming in with these biases that are built into aspects of like white supremacy and this idea of who deserves an education or what they should show up as in order to allow them into this classroom and to access information. Um, and so this behavior can result in control, compliance and punishment, uh, but depending on the, the size and the focus of the course, uh, we might need some policies, but maybe we need to be a little bit more lax in the way that we create those. So I have some examples of more flexible policies that you might want to think about incorporating into your classes. So encouraging students to show up no matter what, even if they aren't prepared. So if they don't have their books, if they didn't do the reading, um, if they are late, still having them show up. Uh, they can still get information out of class, hopefully. They can still glean information from you, from their classmates, uh, and then they're more likely to continue to show up. If they're not, uh, if they're told that the door shuts at a specific time, and if they're not in the classroom, then you're starting without them and you're not gonna open that door. Uh, you're not bringing them into the community and you're not encouraging to, them to show up uh, and to participate and to gain access to that knowledge. Little things like allowing students to move and eat and use the restroom freely. Um, I know that for some of us, we have classrooms that students cannot be eating in, right? It's, uh, it is going to be dangerous for them to have food uh, it might be dangerous for them to be actively moving around or entering in and leaving the classroom freely. Uh, but for those of us that can allow those things, maybe coming up with some idea of how people can do that in a way that isn't going to disrupt others. If you have a student that is uh, neurodivergent and it needs to be able to move their body in order to concentrate, maybe you can talk about having a space in the classroom where they can do that. Um, allowing students to use the restroom freely. Like these are things that humans have to do in order to exist. Um, so can we acknowledge humanity and create policies that don't uh, take points off for people being humans um, and moving from classroom to classroom or having things going on with their bodies that maybe you don't understand. Um, creating policies that allow students to contribute without raising their hands. Um, if people aren't raising their hands, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're screaming at each other. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting into a fight. Um, they're contributing and they're excited to contribute. They have ideas. Um, and then also thinking about our phone and our tech policy. Um, are there ways to create policies with our students so that we're all on the same page? And are there ways to incentivize them to uh, follow those policies without actually assigning points. Um, again, not all these are like a one size fit all thing. Um, it might be very important that people don't have tech out in your class for whatever reason. Um, so if there's a way for us to make sure that students are complying to that because of whatever reason without actually just like, okay, you don't get participation points for the day or you don't get this for the day. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is effort. Uh, and effort grades really assume that students are on an equal playing field. Um, and 
we've touched on this already, but time, experience, energy, and resources can really differ from student to student and from day to day. We have such a wide variety of students that are joining us at NIU. And aside from the students that have been um, in high school and we're going to be seeing more students that were in middle school during the pandemic, um, we have students that are returning from long breaks that are working full-time jobs and have caretaking responsibilities as Lynn pointed out earlier. Um, so many of our students are dealing with chronic illnesses, housing insecurity, and are trying to manage personal relationships on top of their schoolwork. And that is going to impact their ability to fully focus all their effort on your class and your assignments. Not even thinking about the fact that they have other classes generally and other assignments and other expectations in those parts of their lives too. So can we actually determine um, how much effort they put on a specific assignment and if that was quote unquote enough effort? Um, maybe not. So having said that, students are more inclined to engage in meaningful learning and critical thinking when their achievements are recognized through means other than just grades. So this might be giving them uh, feedback along the way. It might be uh, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, um, not just giving them grades like 20 points because you turned in a draft of this thing, but actually like engaging with the content, acknowledging what they've done so far, um, acknowledging that they showed up to class, even if they uh, weren't there in all of the ways that they could be. So uh, examples of the ways that you can be a little bit more flexible uh, when thinking about grading efforts or not grading effort, um, grade the content of the final submission. So if you have something that a project that they're working on over uh, an extended period, don't focus on the number of drafts that they've submitted or the effort that you feel like they've given between revisions. Um, okay, this draft they only added in in text citations. Um, that doesn't seem like they spent a lot of time on that, but you don't know, right? We can't assume that students uh, didn't spend hours in the writing center learning that skill because we don't know necessarily what skills they're coming in with. Um, something that I was told in my early days of teaching, which is uh, now that I have time, like, you know, over a decade of stepping back and reflecting on it, it seems wild to me, but um, this idea that the grade of a C is meeting expectations, and so an A is going above and beyond. We need to make sure that we are creating rubrics uh, with the expectation of to receive an A, you are getting all of these things, not going above and beyond all of these things, um, because that's not something that students can understand uh, if they're putting an effort going above and beyond instead of meeting the requirements, like how do, how do we measure that? What does that even mean? Um, and it was mentioned in session one, but we can give all students opportunities for extensions and redos. Opportunities shouldn't only be offered to the students that are attending office hours um, or contacted you before um, a specific time. There are requirements through the university. There are timelines, there are deadlines that we have to adhere to, um, but we don't need to be nitpicky of, well, this person never used my office hours, uh, so they don't deserve this opportunity. We don't know what was going on with that person during office hours. We don't, you know, they they need, to uh, have the ability to demonstrate their learning just as much as anybody else does. Um, okay, next slide. Thank you. So we're gonna have another breakout session. Um, we're gonna keep this one to 13 minutes as well, just because 
uh, of time. I want to make sure that um, some of you are probably going to have to leave early and that's okay, but we want to make sure that we are respectful of your time. And if you want to have these conversations in the future, you can reach out to us in other spaces. So we have a link to the second Padlet that Mike posted um, in your breakout groups. You'll go to that second Padlet and think specifically about um, about the topics that I just talked about. We're going to think about uh, behavior and effort um, and have at least one person add some notes to the Padlet and we'll all reconnect within the, the next 13 minutes. If there are, uh, make sure you introduce yourself. I should put it that way. Make sure you introduce yourself to the people in your group, just in case uh, all of you know each other except for one. We wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to introduce themselves. Okay, so if we can do that, Mike. No problem, here we go. Thank you. Bring them back. Sounds good. All righty. Hi, everybody. Start, sorry to interrupt yet again, um, but please wrap up. Uh, we're going to be coming back to the main room here in just a minute. So see you there. Michelle, I just saw your comment. We're wrapping up anyway. So you are perfectly fine. You're exactly where you need to be. No worries. Isn't that reassuring? I never get to say that. You're exactly where you need to be. Let's see, I think, is that everybody back? I think so. Yeah, it looks like it, okay. Um, so I just wanted to comment really quickly on some of the things that I've seen on the Padlet. Um, very reassuring. Uh, I see some um, comments about extra credit. We don't have a chance to talk about that today, but definitely check out, um, we have the ebook available for you of grading for equity. Uh, check that out. Uh, Joe Feldman has some feelings about, uh, extra credit. And I think it's definitely worth, uh, thinking critically about how we're using it, if we're using it. Um, access to extensions for all and make sure students know that they can ask for extensions. Uh, for so many uh, college students that are first generation, they don't know that they can ask for extensions. They don't know that they can ask for extra help. Uh, they don't know how to navigate these systems. So uh, students might come to you and say, oh, this happened in my life, so I can't turn this thing in and not actually ask for an extension. They'll just be telling you like, oh, this is what's going on. Um, and as I can't remember if Lynn said this earlier, but I know she said it to me multiple times. She just gives students opportunities uh, like, oh, I see this is happening with you. Take an extra week, take some extra time. Um, here are some extra resources to help you, um, which is 
Fantastic. And I also want to comment about this idea of uh, giving students motivation um, by telling them how it connects to real world stuff, uh, showing them that there's other people doing this in, um, in whatever field they're looking at and connecting it to what's going on outside of the classroom. I love that. Um, can you give me the next slide, please, Yvonne? Okay, so we got to wrap up. Um, unfortunately, uh, I know for some of you, it's probably been a long morning. So I appreciate you uh, getting through this with us together, but also we could continue this conversation for a week. And I think it would be still enriching and really, really interesting. Um, and hopefully the practices that we talked about today, uh, even if they're not gonna work, for all of your courses. I hope that we're all walking away with a recognizing that we need to be intentional about our grading. What are we demonstrating to our students that is important by the ways that we're grading them, we're grading them, excuse me, um, especially when we're thinking about attendance and participation and behavior and effort. Um, in the chat, we're gonna put a link to another Padlet which is an optional reflection. Um, Dr. Smith did the same thing. Great minds and all that. Um, so this is a place where you can reflect either now or later. The link is going to exist for a while. Um, and what you've heard today and how it applies to your own teaching and share that with others in an anonymous sort of way. Um, but I would love to give you all a couple minutes uh, if you wanna put something in the chat or turn on your mic, what are you uh, taking away from today's workshop? What do you need to continue to think about? What questions do you have? So is there anybody that wants to share? Lindsay, maybe we can stop sharing the slide and see people faces, hopefully. Sure. I'll say I'll say something, Lindsay. I think it's just I love these workshops right before a semester begins because it's impossible to have too many reminders of how grading connects to learning and how we can't really serve our students in the best ways possible if we don't think about how grading can create obstacles for them instead of serving them well. So, Am I perfect at it yet? No. Am I going to work on it for the whole rest of my career? Yes. But it's just a great reminder heading in to put ourselves in their shoes and how they how they see what we're doing and how we might be setting up inadvertent obstacles for them. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. And I think that that's like, that's it. We're uh, hopefully as people, we continue to grow. And as professionals and educators, we continue to grow. And um learn new things and unlearn things. And this is all part of a process, especially for those of us that are actually in this world of uh, teaching and learning, right? Um, anybody else have something they would like to share? I see Melissa is talking about specific concrete examples. We're going to uh, be continuing these conversations in other workshops. And um, I believe we're gonna have a, a book club going on too. So we'll be able to get a little bit more into specific examples. Um, anybody else wanna talk about some things that they're working through or walking away with? I'll have to say that I was really, um... I thought it was a really great question that I had never considered before is like exactly what do we want our attendance points to mean? Uh, Lynn, that was, you know, it's like to remove ego from that. It's like what I have to say is so important. You have to be here to absorb it. And is that actually the case? <laughs> you know, um, I I have to ponder that for a while because I, I think that was a very honest thing to have to think about. 
I like to say something to that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. So I have Fairday 143 for years, and there's a lecture hall that designed for 200 students. And at the beginning of the semester, um, I would have 198 of them sit in the room. And that's really not very accessible to our student. Um, but then as I evolve and develop and learn more and make my course like super flexible, whether they show up or not show up, they can still pass the, the course. Um, I have a tiny group front center and, and we have a lot of good interaction. So I have a uh, class side that up to 200 students, which there's no way I can know all of them, right? But when I make all the changes over the year, I have a core group that always show up and there's a community and they get to know me really well. I get to know them really well. And then for the rest of them, um, I make myself available to emails or um, office hour, virtual office hour and in-person office hour. But it's really hard to prepare and then only have like 20 out of 200 show up. But then I keep having to remind myself, this is what I wanted. I designed the course so that it can be this way. So yeah, I'm, I'm still learning. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you find something that worth thinking more about. I have to say, I found value in all of this, specifically, um, Amory, to to your point, Lynn, what you said was was very very profound about ego. Um, it is hurtful when you go to a class and not everybody is there. Um, but I I do it gives us something to ponder and to really think about why we're doing things the way that we're doing them and how we can really reach students, our diverse student population in meaningful ways and ways that we need to change. And so I've really enjoyed the conversations with this dynamic group of professionals and all you have put out there, all of you, it's, this is great content. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I see your comment uh, to Melissa about a repository. Um, oh, those of us uh, for Seidel here, um, especially uh, Stephanie, Yvonne, Lynn and I can think about maybe how we can make that work um, and how we can share things. Uh, obviously within um, the English department, I'm sure people would be willing to do that as well, but um, happy to continue to think about that and uh, think about how we can share that with everybody. Um, so thanks everybody for showing up and sharing with us and being willing to uh, be maybe uncomfortable and challenged um, and affirmed, I'm sure. Um, Yvonne has a couple things to say before we leave, so I will hand it over to her. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you everybody for, for participating. Um, we've had some very thought-provoking discussions and there are some additional resources that we'll share with everyone who attended and that connects with one of the requests for information that we just were talking about. I'll also share a Qualtrics survey that we, we use Qualtrics to continue our programming development. So, and we also have a question on this survey about continuing the conversation. The last question on the survey is asking if you are interested in participating in some group this semester that builds upon the discussions that we've had in the sessions this morning. So I would um, encourage you all to please complete that and then we'll contact the people who are interested and continue those conversations. And we do have the ebook available through the NIU library and that link will be shared as well. Remember the Seidel team is here to help you. We are excited to have the opportunity to provide support in many different ways. And we thank each of you for your dedication and for your continued professional development interest in building the inclusive and culturally responsive support and excellence in teaching and learning that um, we strive to continue improving every day. Have a great semester, everybody, and please remember to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Yvonne.
Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good luck with the, the semester and the snow. <laughs> Both of those things. <laughs> so thankful for virtual events with the snow. 100%.